Well, hello everybody and welcome to the first webinar of 2016 and uh, we're very excited. This is going to be a terrific year and we hope that you will join us in changing the world one webinar at a time. Welcome to Dr. Uh, Live with Dr. McDougall. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, the uh, webinar coordinator for Dr. McDougall. And today we have a, a special treat and I think you will all enjoy hearing Dr. McDougall talk about his uh, 40 plus years of experience and knowledge in the uh, start solution and plant-based uh, world. And uh, I want to welcome Dr. McDougall and thank you for being here for all of us today. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you notice a small change if you have me on the picture. Uh, I have a uh, decided to wear a little bit of facial hair for a while. I've been watching the TV series Vikings and I, I think those guys look pretty tough and strong and I've decided once again to, to wear some facial hair. I've done that many times in my life. Uh, Mary says it makes me look a little bit more professional, like a real doctor. So let's give it a try. That you look very nice thing. Yeah, good. <laughs> I heard or I saw on Facebook that you um, reached uh, went above the one hundred thousand likes on your Facebook page. Yes, yes we have. Uh, things things are going well. Uh, people are are starting to learn about us, and uh, you know, once once as I've said so many times before, once your eyes are opened, you know, once you can see the truth, then uh, you. You follow it the best you can, and uh, you're not dissuaded to other persuasions of, uh, of uh, harmful behavior. Uh, but first, you have to know the truth, and that, of course, is what we try and do through our Facebook and our webinars and our website, which is uh, practically free, all the information. So uh, more and more people are, are joining the crowd. Uh, I'd like to see it move faster, but you know, it is what it is. Yes, well, you, have been, you are uh, releasing a, a new book right so uh, we're working on it it won't be soon uh, surprisingly it oh. takes a long time to write a book uh, they have a release date if you look on amazon it's called the healthiest diet on the planet the release date is september of 2016. i'll be surprised if it gets done by then but who knows i mean the uh, when the book company which is harper one uh, puts their uh, focus and attention solidly behind it a lot of things could happen we'll just have to see but right. uh, it'll be It'll be uh, new things, but the same theme. It'll be uh, new information, uh, enhancing points of view, and the uh, Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning will be a centerpiece. Uh, it'll be a standalone centerpiece. There are gonna be a lot of color pictures in this new book. Uh, Mary's gonna have recipes. Uh, it'll, it'll be a, a very different book, but don't expect any surprises. I won't be uh, recommending uh, Chicken slices <laughs> over potatoes. <laughs> right. Okay. Very good. Well, Dr. Maduro, we have a little three-minute video from uh, uh, from a few years back oh. and that I would like to show the audience, and it has to do with today's presentation. So good. why don't we go ahead and give and it a watch try, that. and then maybe I'll have a comment. Okay. All right. I, I haven't seen it. I don't I have no idea what it is, but all right. Yeah, it's a surprise. Here we go.
Well, I, I have to say uh, my prediction that things will be better soon <laughs> hasn't come true. Uh, I probably that, that was, that's probably a show from maybe uh, 20 years ago. Oh. And, uh, so uh, anyway, we'll show a few more of those. That, that was a fun one you picked. Well, I just think that that clip where you can see the yes. black flow uh, really is uh, eye-opening. It's dramatic. It's dramatic. It's dramatic. Uh, since today, Dr. McDougall, you're, you're talking about the start solution. I wanted to um, uh, encourage people, I guess, to get this book that really, truly changed my life. I mean, I, I went to the 10-day program and it was amazing. Uh, but until I started reading the book, every, everything opened up for me, all, all, all the questions I have, and you really addressed all of them. So I'm going to put here um, a little link for that people can see if they don't have the book yet to please uh, go ahead and get it. This is something that I'm just doing. Dr. McDougall did not ask me to do this, but I think it's very important that it, uh, everybody has a copy of the Start Solution. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gustavo. I, I, think, I think it's the best book that I've ever done. When my son read it, he's a doctor, uh, Dr. Craig McDougall, when he read the book, uh, The Start Solution, he then went went and read a book I wrote uh, maybe 30 years earlier called The McDougall Plan. And he said, uh, after he read the plan, he said, you know, Dad, he says, uh, you, there's been nothing new you've written. You said the same thing in the plan 30 years ago. He said, uh, why did you write the starch solution? I said, well, I think I said it clearer for people. Uh, I think it's a much, I know it's a much better written book, but the message hasn't changed. The truth is the truth. I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes going over the idea of starch with people because until you get the concept of starch, you're, you're going to be lost. Uh, it's not going to work out for you. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about starch for a minute and uh, uh, see if we can go through some of the basic principles. All Very right. You, you have the, the presentation up well, I hope. The, the book is The Starch Solution. And uh, when I decided to write this book, uh, the uh, publishers, which is Rodale, uh, they initially said that that's going to kill the book uh, with the name Starch. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to take that risk. And it was a risk, and they were willing to uh, go along with that risk with me to put the word Starch right there on the front cover. And you notice also that there's a potato there on the front cover. And they said, well, that will kill it also. And if you, those of you who have an imagination, I've never said this in public before, and I probably shouldn't right now. Any of you will just uh, allow your imagination and uh, look at that potato and imagine that potato is uh, somebody's hand. And notice what the potato peel is doing. I don't know, some of you get it, some of you don't. But I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, telling people, too bad. This is the way it's going to be. You know some of the expressions I could use but won't use, but that reflects how I feel about the public's attitude in terms of uh, resisting the starch. Get over it. Uh, you have to understand this or it's not going to work for you. Dr. McDougall, we, um, the, the presentation is not showing in the whole screen like you had it before. All right. I don't know if you could um, reset it or something. Let's, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let me see if everything's okay here. Sure. If it's everything's just... okay there. So hopefully, and we had it perfect before, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Well, it always works perfectly uh, when you're rehearsing. <laughs> How about that? It's still showing um, the, some of the other parts of the, of the, of the PowerPoint. Right, right. I mean, we can see it. It's yeah, just well, that let, it's me, in... let me see if we can stop this and uh, if... we can uh, cut this part later on when the video is edited so that uh, people don't have to watch this uh, area. watch our our, our, <laughs> our problems right <laughs> the technology uh, now, now and there you have it okay okay good Perfect. all right well, um, I won't go over my other comments about the cover on the book, but no, I hope you get it, uh, that the uh, start solution clearly says to people right to their face, 
that uh, you're supposed to eat starch and uh, you got to get over it and you got to get your ideas around uh, this concept or you're never going to succeed. Uh, you're going to be hungry. You're not going to lose the weight permanently. You're not going to get the health problem solved. So people have to eat. Uh, there are three sources of the calories uh, that people can get from food. You can get calories from protein, which we rarely do. Uh, usually protein is utilized for building things like hormones or some muscles. And when you take an extra protein, what happens is that extra protein is excreted uh, through the kidneys out into the urine. We rarely burn protein as fuel, only with desperation, like if we're starving to death, uh, then we'll, or you're on a crazy diet like the Atkins diet, then you'll burn protein uh, for fuel and you'll also con convert some of that protein to sugar because the body absolutely requires sugar. There are certain cells that won't uh, work without having sugar, like red blood cells, uh, certain cells in the uh, kidneys, they will not function without having carbohydrate or sugar to use for fuel. Uh, the brain also uses carbohydrate uh, almost exclusively, except under desperation situations like starvation. The other source of calories would be fat. And fat is really a, a form of calories that's used for times of starvation. It's a, it's a stored form of calories. It's a, it, it is the, uh, the food, fuel you use when you don't have the ideal food, fuel available. The ideal fuel for people is carbohydrate or sugar. And really those words are the same, carbohydrate and sugar. People get offended by the word sugar, but and they somehow like the word carbohydrate better. But it really, it is sugar that fuels the body. The process is called gly gly glycolysis. We learned about it in junior high and high school. It's what cells prefer to burn. Uh, they will burn some fat during exercise. Some little muscle cells will burn fat, but most of the body burns carbohydrate or sugar. <clears throat> now, when I talk about uh, sugar, people have uh, a reaction, an emotional reaction, uh, but I like to talk more about starch than sugar. Starch is sugar. Starch is complex carbohydrate. It's carbohydrate. But when I mention st starch, that becomes even a more distant concept for people. They think uh, starch is something that you use in the kitchen to uh, or in the laundry room to uh, uh, stiffen shirts or starch has been used in medicinal products for uh, centuries. Uh, that's what people come to mind usually when I mention starch. Then the next thought, once they get past the idea of it being used as a uh, laundry product, is they think starch, when you talk about starch, you're talking about unhealthy food like white bread. That's what comes to mind in people when people think of the word starch. And then the next thing that people think about when I say the word starch is they say, starch, you don't want to eat starch. Starch is sugar and starch turns to fat and fat makes you fat. And you, when you think about that, and you'll have to go over this with your friends and relatives and family, you'll have to go over the idea that you don't want to eat starch, you don't want to eat sugar, like rice, you don't want to eat rice because rice turns to fat and makes people fat. Well, excuse me. You know, up until recently, there were 2 billion Asians living on diets that were 90% rice and there were no fat people. Bring that up as a concept, something people can see, something people can open their eyes with is the idea that people who eat starch-based diets are trim. <clears throat> starch is the proper word, I have to tell you. There's no other word that replaces it. This is a journal called Starch, a medical journal, scientific journal. And if you want to publish uh, scientific papers about using starch as food or in other industrial ways, such as paper making or uh, many ways starch is used, then you publish your scientific article in this journal called starch. Uh, the word uh, starch in German means strength. It's just in the United States and a few other countries there, they get mixed up and uh, really don't understand that starch is a good word, a proper word. It's a word that should be used. It's the word that a grandma used uh, 30, 40 years ago when she talked about what we were going to have for dinner. She talked about starch, the starch that we were going to eat. Now, starch is, uh, or let's just start with sugar. Sugar is made by plants. Uh, the primary sugar made is glucose. The way plants do it is they take water from the ground uh, they take carbon dioxide from the air and they take the energy from the sun and they mix all this up, up through a process uh, called photosynthesis 
and they create glucose molecules. And this is what a glucose molecule looks like, is one of these ring structures. And when you take <clears throat> many of these ring structures and you put them together uh, in long chains, then they become what is known as starch. And these starches may contain 10,000 of these uh, glu individual glucose molecules linked together. And when they're linked together as one long chain, they're referred to as amylose. And when they're linked together as branching chains, they're called amylopectin. And of course, some of you will recall that the uh, enzyme in your mouth that dig digests starch is called amylase. And human beings have amylase in their mouth and in their intestines to digest amylose and amylopectin. My cat Einstein, he doesn't have amylose in his intestinal tract because his food is not starch. Uh, these starch molecules, they're um, or long chains, they're put together in uh, packages in the cells. And uh, these cell, these packages are called amyloplasts. So inside an individual cell, you have these uh, vacuoles, these, uh, these uh, packages with uh, thousands of, uh, of chains of sugar, in other words, amylose and amylopectin. They're put together in these packages called amyloplasts. And uh, these are the storage vacuoles that are utilized to provide energy to the body. Uh, <clears throat> starches are, are foods like potatoes and sweet potatoes and grains and legumes. Those are starchy foods. What they are is they're storage organs that plants use for, uh, to renew their life uh, during the next season. Uh, during the growing season, a plant will synthesize all these sugars, store them in these uh, starch uh, vacuoles, and uh, then the plant dies in the fall. And when spring comes, what happens is the part of the plant that stored all this starch, it germinates and becomes a new plant, becomes a new potato plant, or it, uh, it, they grow above ground storage organs called seeds, and which are grains and uh, legumes. It, they have these uh, above ground storage organs. And when the plant dies, what happens in the spring these uh, beans, peas, lentils, rice grains, wheat grains, and so on, which are the starches, these above ground storage organs, they sprout and become a new plant. So the plant makes starch for its own purposes. It's important to understand that these plant parts that store all this sugar, uh, they do it for, for, for important reasons for themselves and they do it in a manner that allows you to get adequate energy to provide for your daily needs. You need to eat starch. Now, a lot of people are focused on other part plants that don't have a lot of energy in them. These are non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. Uh, people who eat these almost exclusively, they call themselves nutritarians. <clears throat> uh, they call themselves vegans. Uh, they, they, they should call themselves in pain and starving because a lot of folks, and I know them, I meet them all the time, who try to eat a diet that avoids starch that instead focuses on these non-starchy green and yellow vegetables, they, they can't understand how anybody can be a vegetarian. They can't understand how anybody can do this. Well, I can't understand how you could do it either, trying to eat these non-starchy vegetables. So the diet I teach is based on part, parts of plants that have lots of calories. You need calories to survive. Now you can have some of these non-starchy green and yellow vegetables as side dishes, but the main part of your meal must be starch, like potatoes, rice, corn, beans, peas, and lentils. You need that energy. You need the satisfaction. And you can also add to your diet uh, some non-starchy fruits, but it's very difficult to live on a fruitarian diet. Uh, it's possible, but difficult. So this is, this is starch. I'll just show you some pictures of starch. When you look at these pictures, I mean, they should bring uh, good thoughts of eating to mind. These are, these are foods that are delicious, satisfying. This is one of my typical lunches. It'd be uh, a, a tortilla with uh, some beans and maybe rice. Maybe, maybe if I get a little bit of uh, interest in a little more richness, I might put a little guacamole on, on this, also some salsa. Just the idea of biting into corn, the sweetness of, uh, of corn. Of course, corn's been a common starch that people have eaten for, for eons. Sweet potatoes. 
Now, this is what, when I put this slide up, most people, they think, well, that's comfort food. Well, I love that. That's what I want to eat. And the reason you react that way is because uh, starch is your food. You know, uh, you're, you're designed to live on starch. I, uh, you can't hear me? No. Yes, I, we can hear you. Yeah, they can hear yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Mary, Mary said we were having a problem, but we're not. And how about this? Uh, this is a typical meal that Mary and I will eat uh, for uh, dinner maybe two or three times a week. Well, she'll make uh, uh, beans. I know she has some red beans on for tonight. We'll have beans and rice and maybe some other uh, vegetables along with it. <clears throat> now, I love this statement. I actually put it in the book, The Starch Solution. This is uh, from one of my patients, and uh, she says it, uh, some, a real important thing about starch, starch. She says, what I love best about your focus on starch in this lecture, the lecture I'm giving you right now, is that it is much simpler for me to understand than focusing on carbs, proteins, and fats. I know what a starch is. I can recognize that food easily, and I can grow starchy foods in my gardens. But how do I grow a protein, a carb, or a fat? Those explanations were always too far removed from what I see on my plate. The word starch uh, actually was demonized uh, back in about 1977 when uh, the dietary goals for the United States were uh, uh, published by, uh, by our government. Uh, <clears throat> what happened is the, the people from the food industry uh, started giving other names to starch so that it may have people um, have a hard time recognizing what they're supposed to eat. They started calling starch complex carbohydrate. Well, what's a complex carbohydrate? When people, when people are told to eat more complex carbohydrates, they don't know what to choose. But when we use the word starch back before 1977, back in your grandmother, great, great grandma, grandmother's days, it was easy to understand what we were to choose. They've done the uh, same thing with other foods. If you read uh, the dietary guidelines, uh, that came out in 2010, and I'm sure it's the same way in 2015. When they t talk about uh, the harmful aspects of food, they tell you to stay away from saturated fat and cholesterol. Well, what's saturated fat and cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is only found in animal foods. Saturated fat is beef and chicken and eggs and cheese. So by, <clears throat> by the efforts of, uh, of um, industry, they've actually changed the nomenclature so that it's hard for you to choose what to eat. It becomes very confusing. If it was a simple, simply said and used in common language, people would say, what I eat is starch and I don't eat chicken, beef, pork, eggs. But government's in, or industry's influence on the government has made it so that uh, we don't even have the right words to decide what we're supposed to eat. Uh, we are a starch eater. The tip of our tongue tastes uh, sweetness with pleasure. We have sweet tasting taste buds on the tip of our tongue because we're supposed to seek sugar. And that sugar is in the form of corn and rice and potatoes and some fruits and maybe occasionally some honey. Uh, we don't have taste buds for protein on the tip of our tongues. Uh, my cat Einstein, he has taste buds for protein on the tip of his, his tongue, but he has no taste buds for sweetness because he's designed to eat meat. Uh, starches are clean fuel. They're low fat. They contain no cholesterol. They don't grow pathogens like E. coli. I mean, if there's a pathogen on your starch, it's because some animal uh, you know, defecated or got their bowel contents all over your food uh, because these uh, plant parts don't grow uh, infectious organisms, microbes that infect people. And they also contain very low levels of poisonous chemicals uh, as opposed to, say, animals that are high on the food chain, which are just loaded with uh, pesticides and uh, provide another uh, source of danger. Uh, starches are uh, complete nutrition. They have all the protein you need, all the amino acids, all the vitamins and minerals, dietary fiber, carbohydrates, they're complete nutrition. You can live on potatoes alone. In fact, there's a study I talk about in the book, The Starch Solution of a man and a woman. Uh, the study was, uh, done at, in 1925, and you can look it up. It's a, a free study available on the internet. And uh, they fed this man and woman who were athletic people, by the way, they uh, were very active. They fed them a diet exclusively of potatoes, but they had a problem. The, the potatoes were hard to get enough energy from them. So uh, they had to add some oil, which has no vitamins, minerals, or protein to the diet. 
And still, the diet provided adequate nutrition, uh, supplied all their needs, even though half the diet was oil. All the nutrients came from potatoes, which were diluted in half by the oil. And the other interesting thing they said in this paper is they found that they did not tire of the uniform potato diet. There was no craving for change. There have been a couple other studies similar to this. You can live on potatoes or sweet potatoes alone. It provides everything you need in terms of nutrition. You can't live on grains and legumes alone. They're deficient in vitamin A and C. So you would have to add um, a slice of orange or a, a flower out of broccoli to get the A and C. But otherwise, grains and legumes will provide almost complete nutrition. <clears throat> the reason you should understand that starch is the human diet is because it always has been the human diet. All large populations of healthy, trim people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. If you uh, recall, uh, the Aztecs and the Mayans are known as the people of the corn. Uh, rice is the, has been the diet, the traditional diet of the people of the Far East. Uh, the Middle East, which we <clears throat> watch extensively when we turn on the news in the evening, uh, they uh, have lived bar mainly on barley and wheat, and that part of the world has been known as the breadbasket of the world. And potatoes have been the diet of people of uh, South America. Uh, all large populations of people throughout all of their viable history have lived on starch-based diets. So if they always have for, you know, at least a million years, then they still should. But people have gotten confused uh, when they've studied archaeology. They've gotten confused because they've gone to, to sites where people used to live and they'll dig around where they, they used to live and they'll find uh, bones and they'll find uh, knives and they'll find uh, uh, knife marks on the bones and that's all they find. And so they said that people used to be hunter-gatherers with an emphasis on hunting because what we found is animal bones and uh, tools for uh, cutting animals. They didn't find any orange peels or potato peels or, um, or uh, rice kernels. Uh, well, of course they didn't. These things uh, deteriorated after a few years, but the bones preserves. And so some of the early conclusions that we were hunters, with hunter gatherers with an emphasis on hunting came from this faulty archeology. span <clears throat> But recent archeology, span uh, over the last say, say 30 years, and these have been published in our major medical journals, They've examined uh, the sites where people lived in more in greater detail. And what they've been looking for are these things here. Do you see these, uh, these, uh, va these round uh, uh, vacuoles? Okay, look, 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 look at those vacuoles. They found these. These are the starch granules we talked about a few minutes ago. These are the starch, the storage organs for starch. When they looked at the sites in detail, what they found is they found these starch granules. For example, this comes from a site in Mozambique in in Africa, uh, that's 105,000 years ago, they found these starch granules. Uh, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a study of uh, some populations that were uh, Neanderthals, and they found these starch granules. And this is uh, like 44,000 years ago that these starch granules were, uh, uh, were harvested and consumed. And you see on top the starch granules from this Neanderthal site from between the teeth of the Neanderthals. And uh, this lower set of uh, pictures uh, looks at modern cooked barley. And so these, these people, they ate, not only they ate the starch, but they ate cooked starch. Uh, here's a, a site uh, from uh, Italy, Russia, three different sites in Czechoslovakia, and they found uh, starch granules among their, their uh, grinding tools. Uh, a site in uh, South America, which is uh, uh, down in Chile, what they found is uh, a site that preserved organic material easily because it was a peat bog site. And uh, they found evidence of potato eating that goes back 14,000 years. They found 45 different kinds of edible plants. Uh, here's a, a site of, uh, from Western Peru where they found seven different skulls. If you look at the, uh, the, the brown area there, you can see uh, the teeth 
of, uh, of one of the people that they're studying, one of the remains of the people they're studying. And between the teeth, they found a starch granules that they came from squash and beans, peanuts and grains. And since I put these studies together, there have been many, many other studies published of different sites. You, you can find them. They're showing that people were starch eaters. Uh, this is the Iceman, uh, which was discovered thanks to global warming in the Alps. And uh, he was very preserved. Uh, he was found with tools for hunting. Uh, inside of his stomach, they found a little bit of animal food. But when they analyzed this man's hair, what they found that he was primarily vegan based upon hair analysis. His diet was almost exclusively starch and other plants. He just occasionally, and that's what other people do, the hunter-gatherers occasionally got lucky at the hunt. Uh, the gladiators uh, from 1800 years ago, their bones were were evaluated to see what they ate in terms of their long-term diet. And what they found is the gladiators were basically vegans. Uh, they were known as the barley men. And you wanted to be a vegan as a gladiator because you wanted to have all the strength and endurance you could possibly get together. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, they reported this about the vegans being, or the gladiators being vegan, one of the things they included in the study was the idea that this is proof that gladiators were obese. And what they said in the original publication is the reason gladiators were obese is because it made a better show. You could cut them and they would bleed and the audience would be much happier seeing that bleeding, that, that fighting obese gladiator. Well, I went back and looked for evidence of obese gladiators and I found it in mosaics of that time. And I looked at various mosaics to see whether or not gladiators were, were obese. I couldn't find any obese gladiators from artwork that was done 1800 years ago. This is completely flawed. It's a bias that people have so strong, even in the archeologic community, that starch makes you fat. So obviously if people eat starch, they must be obese. So gladiators were obese. I thought that was interesting, but of course it's faulty thinking. Uh, Roman soldiers, they uh, were told, uh, they told their leaders and, and the leaders told them that before they go to battle, they are to eat grains so that they'd have strength and win the battles. Alexander the Great uh, conquered the world on uh, corn, grains. It's not uh, maize like we think of, but uh, uh, the word for uh, various kinds of grains, wheat, et cetera, was corn. And Alexander the Great conquered the known, known world with an army that was fueled by starch. Same thing with Gen Gen Genghis Khan, conquered the known world with uh, an army that's fueled by starch. And today, the winners of various marathons and triathlons live on starch-based diets. Uh, the winners of the uh, Honolulu, Boston, and Chicago marathons, there's just three of them that I can think of, were won by Kenyans this past year, living on a diet that's 80% corn. So the starch solution is the solution for you and your health problems. It also is the solution for, or one solution, one very important solution for our environmental problems that we have, uh, you, can, uh, you can produce 17 times more calories on the same piece of land by growing starch than you can by growing livestock. So I, I encourage you to uh, read this book. I uh, especially encourage you to get in your mind clearly the idea that you are a starch eater, you're a starchitarian, you're a starchivore. And once you get that in mind, then you have a chance to succeed in terms of your health. You cut your food bill by about 80% too. Right, so. right. Thank you, Dr. Martugo. That is, uh, I've seen your presentation and it's always wonderful. It's brilliant. Thank you so much. It's very clear. And I think that's what a lot of people uh, want in uh, the, that are here in this webinar because it is so overwhelming sometimes to change a lifetime of eating uh, so many foods that are damaging. Uh, what, what is your main message today to keep the START solution? simple and right. working. Yeah, you, you know, what you need to do is you need to find a starch you like. And I know there's one you like, uh, like rice or pasta or, or corn, or pick several starches that you like and make at least 70% of your diet starch. You can make 90% of your diet starch as the Asians did up until 35 years ago. In uh, China, 35 years ago, fewer than 1% of the population had type two diabetes. And at that time, 90% of their diet was rice. Now the Chinese uh, boast that 12% of the people have type 2 diabetes and half of them are pre-diabetic, pre half the Chinese. And they've cut the rice down and they doubled their intake of animal foods and oils. 
This is happening all over the world. Uh, so a little history lesson, a little history lesson, a little geography lesson, will serve you well. And then just just do it. You'll find you have tremendous satisfaction. You love the foods. Uh, I showed you some examples of foods you already like, and make the change. Don't be hungry. Uh, enjoy the foods. You're not meant to be hungry. Add a little salt and sugar to it to the food if you'd like. Most people can tolerate that. A few can't. Uh, you, you need to get this idea of starch in your mind or your efforts are going to fail. I've seen it over and over again. There is a little bit of a learning curve, but I think that um, as we, as people journey, go through this journey and you just find out, like you said, what, what you like and what you don't like, and you just end up with a diet that fits your needs and that is simple. I think that's what's important. It needs to be simple. It needs to be tasty. It needs to be satisfying. It needs to be right. It needs to be right from every aspect you look at it. In terms of your of your uh, uh, food budget, it can't be more expensive. It has to be less expensive. In terms of, uh, of providing energy for activity, it must be a better fuel. Uh, that's why endurance runners and other athletes they live on high carbohydrate diets. See, I use that word carbohydrate, and you don't know what you're talking about again. They live on high starch diets. It has to be right in terms of uh, things that trouble a lot of folks, like the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, livestock industry, the factory farming issues, the uh, abuse of animals. Uh, you, you can't be having a food program that uh, turns your stomach when you see how these uh, animals are produced. It has to be right in terms of the environment. Uh, and uh, starch is, it has, to, it has to be right in terms of your, your religion. Uh, whatever religion you are, if you uh, follow the Bible or the Quran or whatever, whatever re religious teachings you follow, they all say the same thing, and that is that you're supposed to eat, live on starch and uh, keep uh, animal intake for sacrifice and feast or famine or, you know, very minimal intake. So er everywhere this message comes from, every, every aspect of your life, it all has to ring true, and it does. And when you look at a diet based on animal foods, it all rings wrong. It, it, is, uh, it is wrong for your health. It is wrong for the environment. It is wrong for... For, uh, uh, for the animals, it, 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 it rings 100% wrong. The only thing that rings right about an animal food-based diet is uh, the fact that it's big business. It's a lot of money, and that's why it still rings. Right, right. What, what, was, uh, what would you say, uh, Dr. McDougall, about people who raise the issue of high glycemic index? Well, a glycemic index is a way of measuring uh, uh, the body's response to eating a food. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, David Jenkins from the University of Toronto, he uh, invented this index and uh, first published about it in 1982. Uh, what they did is they fed people uh, foods, different kinds of foods, either white sugar or white bread were used as standards, and they measured the response of the blood sugar, see how high the blood sugar went after the meal, and they called that 100%, the response, say, from eating white bread. And then they compared other foods to that standard. And whether it went higher or lower, they gave it a percentage rating, which is the glycemic index. Well, what you find is when you eat um, potatoes, the blood sugar will go up to 118%. You go, oh, well, that's terrible because your blood sugar went higher than even eating white bread. This must be a sign that you're going to get diabetes. Well, uh, your blood sugar is supposed to go up when you eat food. That's, that's what it's supposed to do. When you eat animal foods, uh, the blood sugar doesn't go up. In fact, it goes low, down and you have a, a lower glycemic index. And one food that I remember that has a low glycemic index is a Snickers bar, candy bar. It has a glycemic index of 67%. So people, when that data came out, that was early in the 80s, when they first started talking about glycemic index, people said, well, obviously eating a Snickers bar is better for you than eating a potato. A uh, glycemic index is just one description of a food, and it's been uh, it's been uh, abused. Uh, it's become the source of entire dietary programs. Uh, it is uh, not a guide that you should use in terms of choosing the right foods. Right, right. Well, there are so many questions here um, that I um, people are asking about other topics. I will keep track of these so that in future webinars you can probably address topics such as arthritis and high cholesterol and other things like that. But I think we're getting close to the end of today's webinar. And 
I wanted to ask you just a little bit about the, have you have you had a chance to look at the new guidelines that have come out, the government? I, I haven't seen them yet. Are they published? Yeah, I, I, I think it's today. Today, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. It, or it, yesterday will, it will be interesting uh, to see. There's been a tremendous amount of controversy over it. Uh, actually, PCRM, uh, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, has filed a lawsuit. Uh, and I'm involved in that lawsuit, uh, and it has to do with the fact that these uh, new dietary guidelines are hurting my patients, and that's the that's how I'm going to be presenting to whoever will listen. I don't know where this is going to go. Is uh, I'm going to to say that what is being recommended, which is influenced by industry, the guidelines are heavily influenced by the dairy and the meat industry, and uh, what I'm going to say when I if I get a chance uh, during this uh, lawsuit is I'm going to say. That these new dietary guidelines have, have uh, hindered my ability to take care of my patients. They've harmed my patients, and uh, therefore, as a practicing physician, um, I, I object to what they say. They're incorrect. They're, anyway, I haven't seen them. But uh, well, it would be good to do uh, maybe a future webinar on them. Uh, on the dietary topic. guidelines, I'll, I'll get a chance to read them sometime, probably yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, you know, there have been all kinds of protests over the guidelines. Uh, uh, there have been. Uh, uh, publications, for example, in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, that have said that uh, the new, 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 new dietary guidelines are, are right, they're good for Americans, because now uh, cholesterol is a, a non-issue. You don't have to worry about cholesterol. Well, cholesterol is only an anim animal, so what it's, it's saying is that you can eat all the animals you want. And uh, they also, in this JAMA article, they said that there's no limit on fat intake. You can eat all the fat you want. And the protest from our side has been great, hopefully satisfactory, to put those restrictions back in on cholesterol intake and fat intake. It, it's wrong. That's why people are sick is because they're consuming animal foods and oils, vegetable oils. And, uh, of course, that's what my color picture book is all about, is the two major categories of food poisons, which are animal foods and oils. And right. what you need to eat are starches. But right. this is, ladies and gentlemen, this is all about business. Uh, this is all about selling foods, and as a as a as a downside to selling unhealthy foods, you also support the pharmaceutical industry, the hospitals, the doctors. Uh, you support a whole line of businesses by making people sick with the wrong advice, and so there's a lot of money going into teaching you the wrong thing. But hopefully, uh, we'll have our day in court, our day before the government, just like happened with tobacco. Uh, back in the 1960s, 1964, Louis, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Terry, the, head, the Surgeon General, he came out and he said, uh, cigarette smoking damages people's health. And he put out the dietary guidelines, or the dietary, put out the Surgeon General's report on, on smoking, which uh, virtually killed the tobacco industry back in 1964. Uh, that was Luther Terry who did that. And the same thing was attempted in... Uh, 1977 by George McGovern with the food, and again by C. Everett Coop in 1985, to try and inform the public properly about the foods and how they're making them sick. Well, industry had learned from the experience of the tobacco, uh, the Surgeon General's report on smoking, and they said that they're not going to let that happen to them. And so they took an all-out campaign starting in 1977, which they've spent uh, huge amounts of money, lobbyists, uh, done everything they can to not uh, replicate what happened to smoking in this country. And they've, you know, basically won. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll see what the dietary guidelines. They seem to be, uh, they seem to have a little surprise and be better than what uh, we thought it, they were going to be. Of oh, course, I just, I just read very little, but okay. that's what people are saying. Um, I just want to remind everybody that next week we have a guest speaker and it's going to be a great webinar. Would you just tell the audience a little bit about Dr. Doug Lyle? Oh, okay, Do Dr. Doug Lyle I described as the best psychologist in the world. And he really is. Highly entertaining, uh, very practical. Uh, in, my, in my experience as a medical doctor, I have tried to utilize psychologists over the last 40 years. I can tell you quite honestly, I haven't seen uh, benefits that I'd hoped for. Uh, the therapies they use, the talk, the whatever they use in terms of trying to help people, it's been pretty much useless in my experience. 
Uh, Dr. Doug, Doug Lyle is a, a huge exception. Very entertaining man, very intelligent man. He's worked with us for about, um, about 14 years. We've worked together. He's a friend. Oh, uh, he teaches at the 10 day live-in program. Right. right. Uh, you'll enjoy him tremendously. Uh, Dr. Lyle. Uh, he has a book out called the pleasure trap. He's working on another one. So don't, don't miss next week's uh, uh, webinar. And you know, of course you can spend some time with Dr. Lyle uh, live. Uh, we, uh, we have a 10 day program coming up uh, starting next, next Friday. Right. And uh, Dr. Lyle will, will present many lectures and be there personally. And then he'll also talk at the advanced study weekend, which is February 12th through 14th. And that's a three day weekend. Uh, hopefully you can be there Gustavo where we have uh, guest speakers like, uh, T. Colin Campbell will be there. Uh, Dr. Codwell Esselstyn will be there. Uh, Michael Greger will be at that weekend, February 12th through 14. Uh, many, many uh, interesting new speakers will be at that uh, particular weekend. So there are uh, programs that you can come and uh, get to meet these people live. Uh, we also have a um, uh, an adventure trip to Kauai coming up here at the end of the month. January 30th. So we have room for people to come on the adventure trip. So there are lots of ways you can meet our staff uh, personally. And uh, we're going to include our, our staff, some of our staff on these webinars. So you get to meet them uh, through this medium too. Great, great, wonderful. Thank you. You can everybody can register for the webinar for next week or any of the other events at drmcdougals.com uh, website. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Madugo, for pleasure. being here today. I, and, I, will, uh, I will be back in a couple of weeks. I, I yes, was, good. And, uh, I hope there are no other surprises. I think I'm going to keep the hair. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. <laughs> and, yeah, more professional. Maybe people will believe me more. I look forward to looking at these, uh, these guidelines. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. McDougal. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And, and I'll, see, you I'll see everybody next week with Dr. Doug Lyle. And I like the new additions you're doing. Uh, you're you're adding so much to the webinar with the the well, little we'll little past and... videos and <laughs> Good. everything. Thank All you. right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.